I was a Jesuit seminarian. I was in the novitiate for several years, and I only, we only spoke in Latin when we were in the house, as they called it. And um, we weren't allowed to read anything in English. And I was starved for English, and I found a book. We were up there in Poughkeepsie, New York, and it was pretty isolated. And I'm a, a kid from Newark, New Jersey. And if you're from Newark, New Jersey, you really, really care about the environment. Not because you saw a beautiful environment, but because you saw what happened when people did not take care of beautiful environments. And actually, New Jersey is quite a beautiful state, but it has just been savaged by um, indifferent human care. So um, my, my mother, I was uh, three when my dad, who was an ex-fighter pilot, had trouble breathing one day in 1949, and two days later died of polio, leaving my mother with three little babies. And so we grew up very, very poor in Newark, and I saw a lot of just how hard, how difficult it was for poor kids, poor family, and, and the struggles that people were having. And I think I was sort of destined for the seminary at that point, because the smartest people I knew were the priests around there. The book I found, it wasn't porn, it was Henry David Thoreau's Walden. And I read it five times. I can recite large parts of it because I read it every year. And I became convinced that I wanted to be, I didn't want to be a celibate priest, but I, uh, and I didn't want to go to Vietnam particularly. <coughs> Um, so I wanted to be a forest ranger. I wanted to do things around forestry. So I got in the second year of college and realized that I was not I was never really going to make a living, and I liked science, so I decided to do medical school. Got into San Francisco, UCSF, in 1969. If you're from Newark, New Jersey, and you get into UCSF in 1969, you go, because it's really, <laughs> it quite a party, I must tell you. Um, and I had I got to stay here near the mic. I'm sorry. Um, and it was really quite an adventure. Um, but because I had seen really the casualties of chemical exposures, a woman that my mother knew, her jaw was completely gone. You can imagine being an eight-year-old and seeing somebody with no j lower jaw. And she had been painting radium dials in East Orange, New Jersey, because that's how they used to do the glow-in-the-dark watches, and, they would, and the radium had just rotted out her entire jaw. I remember seeing men coming home from work bright red because they had had a spill of dye, because there were a lot of dyes and chemicals being produced there. The Passaic River was the longest Superfund site, literally in the United States, this is where they were making Agent Orange during the Vietnam era. So I decided I'd go into public health, and partly because my dad died of polio. I ended up working on smallpox eradication in India and fell in love with public health and never really went back to do much pediatrics except in a consulting investigation way. And uh, so while I was in the intensive care nursery, I remember the nurses saying to me in San Francisco, you know, we've seen three babies in the last week from the Fresno area, and they all have gastroschisis, failure of closure of the abdominal wall. We've had four babies in the last month come from down near Visalia with neural tube defects. Do you think there's some chemicals in the environment out there? And, you know, I was just generally, I was going to look into this, and that's how I decided to pursue my career and, and go into it. To make a long story short, I worked for 15 years in California. I started the birth defects program, the community, uh, basically OE, OEHA, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment and others. And I was offered a job in Atlanta in 1994 as the basically the highest health and environment job in the country, the head of the National Center for Environmental Health. You can imagine when I came home to Berkeley and said to my wife and three kids in school, oh good, we're going to move to Atlanta, you can all have your own bedroom. And you know, so we moved to Atlanta, it's 95 degrees, 95% 95 humidity, and my kids decide dad is the stupidest man in the world and they'd rather go back and be three in a bedroom than live in a place with no sidewalks and you, you basically it took an hour to get anywhere because it was all sprawled out with no human infrastructure whatsoever. The job was extremely challenging. I, I was Vice President Gore's lead for health and environment for all his interactions with Russia. So I had uh, nuclear stuff and all this sort of thing, cruise ships, on and on and on. And then about um, 
1999, uh, the head of CDC was writing an article on the big causes of death in the 21st century. And there was a big highway uh, near where I work. It's called Buford Highway. It was seven lanes wide, Kathy. And it had no, uh, it had uh, garden apartments, two and three story high on both sides, and filled with poor people. So I'm driving to this big meeting. And I'm in a hurry, and it's 100 degree, 95 degrees outside. And I look over to the right side of the road, and here's this woman bent over with osteoporosis, and she's struggling. And it's really hot, and there's no shade, and there's no sidewalk, and there's no bus service. And she's carrying a shopping bag, one in each hand, and she's got red hair, and she looks like my mother. And I, I want to stop and give her a ride. I don't do it. I go to my meeting. And I began thinking afterwards, you know, if she collapses and dies, the cause of death will be heat stroke. And it won't be absence of trees, poor urban planning, heat island effects, albedo from the, the road, et cetera, et cetera. No albedo from the road. And if she's killed by a truck going by, the cause of death will be motor vehicle trauma. And it won't be absence of sidewalks, uh, absence of public transportation, poor urban planning. So I went back and I called my friend Howard Frumpkin, who was at the University of Washington, back then at CDC at Emory, and I said, Howie, we can worry about little molecules moving up the food chain and chemicals and lead and atoms. We are worried about great big things like climate change and the disappearance of the ice caps. But what really influences the quality of people's lives? And what we really worry about and should worry about is where we live and where we're raising our children, and where our elderly are being cared for, and how people can be autonomous. And I remember saying to him, you know, my kids go to school, three different schools in Atlanta. It takes my wife and I an hour and a half to two hours to pick them up if they stay for after school activities between the traffic and everything else. And, you know, they cannot get anywhere unless someone gives them a ride. And it's ridiculous. We had a neighbor's kid was killed shortly after his 17th birthday because he was given the keys to the car, took off, and mm -hmm. killed himself. And partly because we hadn't grown children in their autonomy. They hadn't been able to negotiate the world. How many of you, when you were kids, walked and biked to school? And how many of you went out on Saturday morning and, you know, the rule was come back when the street lights come on or come back when it gets dark? but get out of my hair for the rest of the day. And how many of you sat in front of a screen for eight hours a day on average, which is what our kids do today? No one did. And so there are a lot of things that are happening to our children because of how we built America. So I became obsessed with this and wrote this book. I use this for teaching at UCLA. Um, this is a textbook with Andy Dannenberg. And it's really fun when I teach. I have half public health students, about 15 of them, and I have about 15 other students. So, law, business, urban planning, architecture, and uh, it's kind of fun because in the second class I do speed dating because they have to match up um, and do a presentation. So the health person was, has to match up with somebody else. One of my favorites was one of the urban planning students had done a transit-oriented design um, in near the rail station, and he matched up with a young girl or young woman who was from public health who was interested in violence prevention. And she was very interested in how you create sight lines so there's eyes in the street, just as you, you want to have windows looking on the public spaces because people behave better if they are, you know they're being watched. In fact, the studies that show second floor balcony windows, you see about a 40% reduction in crime when they're put in place because the perps can't tell if somebody's looking at them um, from the second floor balconies. Um, and other side, So anyway, they match up, they do this wonderful presentation on how he stops designing the one without windows and he redesigns the whole territory development in a way that she really likes and she really likes it and then they got married. So I've been very successful um, uh, in the teaching. I'm having fun with it too. Um, and I actually received a few months ago an honorary ASLA, um, so I'm, I'm really pleased with that. And this is the book that is the companion for my video series uh, that has aired now um, in about two million homes across the United States. 
we are really at code blue in terms of the health of the American people. Those are strong words. Code blue means you drop everything and you go running down the hall because the patient's dying. And I think in some ways what we've done to our population in the United States is pretty desperate stuff. Here's a small example, but the most prevalent disorder in America is depression. And how did your grandparents deal with mild to moderate depression? They had music, they had festivals, they had celebrations, they had Irish wakes, they had... But people got together. It was the human social interaction. When you go to a Latin American country or to Italy in the evening, what do people do in the evening? They're out in, in Italy, they're out in the Passageda. And they're all walking. By the way, the teenage boys all walk in this direction, and the teenage girls all walk in this direction. There's music and food and, and moonlight and everything else. I mean, they could be home on U Cupid or something uh, looking for somebody nice, but, you know, you can't really beat it. So uh, this is a big deal, a fourfold increase in antidepressant consumption in just 20 years for people in the prime of life. Our friend Richard Louvre has done a beautiful job with um, his work on uh, the, basically the isolation of children. I like to play indoors because that's where the electrical outlets are. And I'm going to use some slides from him and from Howie Frumpkin. I show this picture in the first day of class and I say to my students, we built three million of these a year. What's the message of this particular structure? What's the most important thing in the life of the people that built this structure? That's right, we've wrapped the home, the family, around the car. And we have become, instead of our owning cars, cars in America now own us. They're 25% of the economy of the United States, by the way, um, at least have been through the 20th century. And we've built America assuming that everybody's going to be in the car all the time. Here's a subdivision, it's probably a cornfield or something else, there isn't a tree in sight. And it's pretty hard for a kid on a bike to go from here to here if you wanted to go see your buddies. And then we have the affordable housing policy of the United States. Affordable housing. The affordable housing policy of the United States is drive until you qualify. So the woman in the office next to me lives in Santa Clarita. She loves living in Santa Clarita, but it's a haul to get to from Santa Clarita to UCLA every single day. And she bought there because that's what she could afford. We've built places like this. This is a you, you've seen many of these subdivisions. Suppose you lived in this house, and you really made friends with the person across the back fence, and you said, gee, um, let's have a picnic on the 4th of July. I'll make the potato salad and bring the hamburgers, and, and you can do this and that. She says, oh, yeah, come on over, bring the kids. Bring, you know, and, uh, so, you know, uh, it's a little hard to climb over the fence to bring this stuff. So you Google it, and you find that you could, in fact, drive to her house in 17 minutes. In a way, this is a metaphor for America. The same way that house where it's built around the car is a metaphor for America. The way we've built neighborhoods and communities, this is a metaphor for ridiculous dependency. In fact, the speed at which people get from Santa Monica to here today, I'm sure, it took me about an hour on the number 20 bus. Um, I, and the bus was fine, but I'm sure it was about the same t speed it was in 1900 when they were using the red line trolley cars that, um, as well. You would think we were at war with trees. They're our best friends. And we have taken out 60,000 square miles of photosynthesis in the United States of America. So 60,000 square miles has been paved over. It gets hot in the sun and doesn't produce oxygen and gets, uh, collects pollutants that come down. And by the way, when it rains, it all runs off. It doesn't go um, into the ground as it's supposed to. It's equivalent to the entire state of Georgia. And in medicine, code blue happens when people retain CO2. When your CO2 keeps going up and up and up, you're turning blue. That's what the, look, not enough oxygen as well. But that's when you see a code blue. And I... I gave a talk to all the head, ULI, Urban Land Institute, the top developers in the country. Not a person in the room knew what the Keeling Curve was. No one should graduate grammar school or high school without knowing what the Keeling Curve is. When I was born, the CO2 level of planet Earth was 300 parts per million. Today, 
it is three, about 400 parts per million and continues to go up. We're about a degree warmer than we were back when I was born and it's continuing to go up. Since you're arborists, and you probably you know this better than I, and if you have a newer uh, curve than, or map than this one, let me know. But it's, I was giving a talk in Nashville recently, and I said, well, in 1990, my son was 10 in 1990, Nashville was zone 6. In 2006, Nashville's no, now 7, Atlanta's as hot as North uh, Florida, and New York is now as hot as... Um, Richmond, Virginia. That's not geologic time. That's real time. And people say, well, you know, you're just working up. You, you scientists, you're just trying to scare people and you're working a political agenda. I figure you people that are planting trees aren't doing a political agenda, at least in terms of climate change. You're actually trying to make the world better and happier and cleaner and cooler and better places to live. Trees clear the air. Um, There's a better way to clear the air. We need to get rid of cars. So I'm uh, overstating this a little bit, but at Carmageddon, you all remember it. Remember how much fun it was to be in the city and people were smiling and it was really kind of nice. Everybody was in a good mood, lots of people on bikes. And one of my colleagues went out. She didn't have a picnic on the freeway, but um, she did measure air quality. And air quality improved 25% over the entire region compared to um, before Carmageddon, just by reducing that load of cars. Most important slide, um, this is absolutely shocking to me. This just came out in the last couple of months. And what this is is a comparison using very, very high quality data of people in their late 40s to their mid 60s. Exact comparison, physical exam, blood, urine, questionnaires, the whole deal um, matched, you know, age and smoking and uh, race, etc. And they compared people 20 years ago, not that long ago, with the people the same age today. What do you think happened? Think we got healthier with all the money we spend? People saying they're in excellent health went from 32% to 13%. This is really a big deal, because when people say they're in excellent health, they live a long time. Can you go about your life, or do you need help? 9 to 14%. Do you need a cane or a wheelchair to get around? These people aren't that old, 3 to 7%. So 7% of the people in their 50s need a cane or a wheelchair. You know that smoking and went down and obesity went up. Look at this one, and this is really important to the work you're doing. We doctors have wagged our fingers at patients for 40 years, exercise more, do more exercise, be more physically active. What do you think has happened? The only thing that gets people to be physically active is to build it in, into their incidental life activities. So I've got to be physically active to get to the bus, to get to a carton of milk, to get to the store, to go shopping. But telling people to go to the gym, particularly when they're commuting an hour and a half to Santa Clarita each way, they're not going to do it. And they barely have enough time to make a meal and say hello to their children and their spouse. And I'm, that's not a put down of Santa Clarita. I'm just, no, okay. uh, you know. That's why I live out. I only live 10 miles from work. So here's some slides that uh, Howie Frumpkin, the, my co author, did, and I just wanted to include them. Um, Howie was arguing that we human beings are absolutely miserable when we are disconnected from nature. And. Um, Uh, unfortunately, the guy on the right's myself, except I'm a little fatter than he is. But, um, it, but you all know this is true. I got to be friends with a fellow named Steve Kellert, and he worked with Leo Wilson about biophilia. This is a complicated idea. Human beings have, at least primates have evolved for at least 5 million years. Human beings have been in evolution for about 200,000 years. We've always been in contact with trees, with nature, with vegetation and to suddenly, magically disappear all that vegetation and expect us to be happy when we are hardwired into our DNA and into our brains and into our nervous system to be around nature uh, to make us happy is really, um, it's crazy for us to be giving it up. This is the classic study by uh, Roger Ulrich. This is like 30 years ago and he 
looked at patients that were having gallbladder surgery and they were just randomly assigned to rooms with windows that looked at vegetation and the other half of them were randomly assigned to windows that looked at a brick wall. And he checked to see, I wonder if it makes any difference to how fast people recover. And people got significantly better more quickly. They needed less narcotics and pain medicines. And they had less notes, nurses' notes, about crying or upset or something else. And you kind of know this is intuitively true. And what's amazing about a lot of the research I'll talk about very quickly is just you kind of knew this, but it's nice to have the data. A prison in uh, southern Michigan, this is pretty cool. Which of the prisoners do you think went to sick call more often? The ones that had, and they were just randomly assigned to cells, prison cells, the ones that had windows that faced outdoors, or the ones that had windows facing, bars facing inside? Yeah, it seems per perfectly obvious. Sick call rate was 25%, 24% higher for the ones that couldn't see the outdoors. It's kind of an interesting experiment when you think about it. Is it good to live near parks? A study of 2,000 people in Denmark asking, uh, you know, how far away do you live from green space and how much do you use it? And by the way, how much do you, and, and weighing them, and basically the closer people are to the green space, the more that, you know this, but if people are around green space and places to exercise, they use it more, and by the way, they end up weighing less. In this study, they looked at middle class people, poor people, and wealthier people, and how close they were to um, green space, or how, how green was the environment they were living in. If you're wealthy, the death rate isn't that much different from the no green to the lots of green space people. What do you think happened with the middle class folks? Do they get a benefit from being near green? You bet. What do you think happened to the poor people? Did they get a benefit from being near green? Look how you know their mortality, their death rates, their illness rates were much higher. And just having that green space that invited them out and made it impossible to resist being physically active. It's got to be well maintained. It's got to be policed. It's got to be kept clean. But um, people do better with green space. Most prevalent disorder in America, not a big study, 20 patients with major depression. And every day they'd, they'd walk either around through the city or they'd walk through uh, green space and see trees and nature. Um, and they look to see what happened. And people's thinking and their negativity diminished by being in the presence of nature. And the last study I'll talk about very quickly is the study done by Francis Kuo and Bill Sullivan in, um, this is Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago, and you've heard stories of these gigantic housing projects that eventually had to be torn down because they were fairly inhumane and people didn't take care of them. Sidebar to architecture, by the way, a lot of these places did not spend any money on the amenities that made it pleasant to live somewhere. There was virtually no landscaping in a lot of it. The sound insulation was not good. There was not much beauty, and admittedly, it needed to be policed as well. So one end of the Robert Taylor Homes was actually pretty nicely vegetated. The kids would be out, people would be sitting there, and the other end, they ran out of money, so they stopped adding landscaping at that end of the Robert Taylor Homes. And we do a lot of this in epidemiology. You're looking for natural experiments, and just seeing what happens when this natural experiment, the hardened end, the green end, what would you predict to children, Daria, what would you predict to children's socialization. How well would six and eight year old girls play and differently would they play at the eight at the um, hardened end versus the vegetated end? What's your intuition? My guess would be that they would play better at the green space end. So he had graduate students sitting there just monitoring the quality how much fighting there was, how much uh, conflict, uh, how good was the quality of the fantasy play, um, and basically the work of childhood. And of course, the kids in the greener space actually socialized and behaved much better. And we want future adults to come out of um, role playing of socialization. It's really important stuff. They compared adults as well and interviewed some of the kids. Living in a building with nearby trees, you knew your neighbors better. Why would, I don't even, I can't even figure out what that would be. But somehow having the trees made people feel less defensive and they're more willing to talk to their neighbors. There was less aggression. They were more willing to help, less violent behavior. Boy, if you could cost that out, you know, just 
one less beating, one less assault. That's ten, no, I'm serious. Tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars in real. And think about if you don't need quite so many police, that's a benefit as well. Better self discipline, concentration, and all the rest. We in public health and pediatrics are scared to death of the obesity epidemic. Um, 15 years ago, we were at about 4% prevalence of diabetes. We're now at about 10% prevalence of diabetes. It's just, it's now 2% of the gross domestic product of the United States. And it's entirely driven, not entirely, but largely driven by, uh, the diabetes epidemic is being driven by the di uh, obesity epidemic. Here's childhood weight gain. Um, inner city kids followed over two years. Neighborhood greenness, using satellite photos and controlling for age, sex, residential density. Greener neighborhoods had slower increases in BMI. And you know, if you're out working trying to plant those trees with Mr. Romero, you, uh, you're not going to gain any weight at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> Asthma. Basically, we have this sense that Oh, the trees make us allergic, and that's what's call it causing asthma. I had one friend that said, the problem, we're seeing so many allergies nowadays because all those trees are horny that they're planting. I said, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, they're only planting male trees, and the male trees are looking for girls. And, and, and they don't want female trees because the fruit goes all over. I don't know if it's true or not. But that, was, that was his theory. Um, as you increase the tree density, Asthma prevalence went down, and probably what is, is the bigger trigger is the heat, the dust, the particulates in the air that are triggering asthma, and the trees do reduce the asthma triggers. I love this one. Attention deficit disorder and nature contact. I collect perfectly obvious medical studies. So one of my favorite obvious medical studies, it was actually a headline in one of the medical journals, it was Teenage girls who frequently become drunk are more likely to get pregnant. <laughs> Didn't your mother tell you? Tell you but my, my other favorite one was children who have no access to physical activity are more likely to be hyperactive. Everyone's mother in this room told you, I can't stand it, go outside, run around for a while, and then come back in. And, and this basically just proves it, that kids need to be physically active. And yet we, we box them in their homes, we box them in the car getting to school, we box them in the school, we box them when they get home, and then we wonder why we're, we've tripled the amount of um, Ritalin and stuff that we're giving kids with hyperactivity. The best way to, tr well, the child really needs it, they need it, but boy, I really want to try as many non-drug treatments for a hyperactive attention deficit child. Most of them, are, or a large portion of them are boys. Oh, that's just the comparison graph for various kinds of tests of physical activity. Um, and when the parents scored the kids, their um, activity levels improved as well. Anyway, this is um, vacant lots, and if you green up the vacant lots, we need to cost benefit this, because if we really did a good cost benefit, we'd show real numbers that would convince the Chamber of Commerce that this is something worth doing. And I think I'm done. Does all of this prove that uh, we need to do this? I think there's still a lot more science that needs to happen. But wouldn't it be a shame if we went and we created beautiful, a couple weeks ago, uh, my wife was in Berkeley, and we went to Point Reyes for a hike. We were tired when we came home. and. You know, we'll get a pizza. My son says, well, there's this new pizza place on San Pablo Avenue. San Pablo Avenue, going through Berkeley, was a dump. It was one and two story, sort of broken down stores and bars, and, and it just wasn't a nice place, but it had nice wide sidewalks. And we drive up, and I'm looking around. I hadn't seen it in 10, 15 years. It looks like the Champs Elysees. Well, that's what I'm saying. But it, there were these beautiful trees, and they're now up to about 25, 30 feet. And these storefronts that look so dodgy and unpleasant had suddenly become charming. They were the exact same storefronts, but there's some having the trees over it and the 1920s, 1930s architecture that when it was baking in the sun and dirty looked not so interesting. The trees had added, and I actually felt 
I didn't feel safe walking around there in the old days. And I felt perfectly safe walking around. And people were actually saying hello. And I saw a man stop and pick up a piece of paper on the ground and put it in a garbage can. You never, no, you never would have seen something like that 20 years ago. And so, um, you know, it does socialize us to be in softened environments instead of hardened environments. So we physicians need to write prescriptions for trees and green environments. And we need to get kids uh, out there. And I want to thank Richard Liu and Howie Frumpkin for some of these slides. And uh, to add a tool, no child left inside. Let me stop there. Thank you all very much.